And welcome back to Liberty Under Attack Radio here on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. If you're just joining us, uh, we had uh, Corin Bermudes on, uh, the uh, um, musician uh, from the band uh, Never Known. And uh, uh, with us for this installment of the Direct Action Series is Lenore Skenazy. We'll be discussing her work and uh, free-range parenting, uh, one item on the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action. But before I bring her in, uh, make sure to go check out uh, the FUDA. Uh, you can do so by going to tinyurl.com forward slash freedom umbrella two again that's tinyurl.com forward slash freedom umbrella two okay and Eleanor, are, are you here with us yes i am indeed hello okay awesome hi how are you doing this evening so far so good waiting for the oscars <laughs> good deal good deal okay uh so lenora why don't you start by uh, letting the listeners know uh, who you are and uh, what you do Oh, sure. So, um, so I'm Lenore. I'm the founder of the book, blog, and movement, Free Range Kids. And um, this is a movement that began uh, eight years ago already when our nine-year-old son asked to take the subway by himself here in New York City where my family lives. And my husband and I decided, A-OK, we let him do it. I wrote a column about it. Why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. Two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR <laughs> defending my decision and being called America's worst mom. Um, and really what people were upset about was the fact that I trusted my son to do anything on his own. And that has become almost taboo in America today. You're almost not allowed to give your kid any unsupervised time. And Far from me blaming uh, helicopter parents for being too overconcerned, what's become clear to me in the years that I've been writing my blog is that it's not just the parents, it's not just the marketplace, it's not just the media that are driving us crazy, it's also the government, and I think that's why I'm on your show tonight, um, <laughs> because... Uh, I'd say once a week I hear from a parent who's done something completely normal, rational, and fine. Let the kid wait in the car for a couple minutes while they ran in to get the ibuprofen. Um, let the kid walk to school. Let the kid play in the backyard. Let the kid play in the parking lot, or not the parking lot, the park, literally the park across the street. And because it's so unusual to see a child by themselves anymore outside, people call the cops because everybody's got a phone. They call 911. They say they see one of these, you know, escaped, you know, felons. How, how come a child was allowed out? And um, then the cops come and, and bang on the door and um, demand to know why the parents don't care about the children. And sometimes the, the parents get off with a warning and sometimes they're arrested. And to me, um, this is shocking. I mean, this this pushed me into the libertarian camp. I was a normal New York liberal until I started hearing from so many parents who couldn't raise their kids the way they thought made sense and the way that literally does make sense. It's not like we're in the middle of, you know, World War Three out there. It's, um, <laughs> you know, the, the crime rate today is what it was in 1963. So if your parents let you play outside, there should be no reason that we're arresting today's parents who let their own children play outside. So, um, so that's one of my movements now, or one of the parts of the movement is um, to try to get laws um, passed in towns, neighborhoods, homeowners associations, and eventually states and eventually the federal government that says that our children have the right, literally the right, to some unsupervised time, and we have the right to give it to them without getting arrested. Yeah. Yeah, and that was that was definitely uh, that was definitely well said. I mean, it's 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 uh, I guess it's probably a hard place to be in. I, I don't have kids. I'm only 23. Thankfully, I don't have kids yet. I want <laughs> right, them for I think a while. You're sort of but, our kid, but that's okay. Uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Podcast, fair enough. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I I, I I don't have kids, but it's got to be a strange position to like you try to give your kids you try to give your kids freedom, but the the, the government's breathing down your neck. And I mean, um, there have been kids that have been taken by CPS for less than that. So. Uh, it's it's got to be. I mean, uh, there's the, the the fear the fear that I, I think some of the some of the some of the parents are feeling like like yourself. It, it's not necessarily a, it's not a fear of crime. It's a fear of like uh, uh, the government cracking down on 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 giving children well, it, basic it is, freedom. You know, it's sort of um, a vicious circle, I guess, because I think that parents are afraid, um, extra afraid of crime than they have to be, because that's all you see on TV. You know, it's twenty four hours 
of bad news from around the world and repeated uh, ad nauseum. And the brain, you know, every time it sees something happening, it's almost like it happened again. So if you see the story of a kid who was kidnapped and you see it again, and then it's on the nine o'clock news and 905 news and 910 news, it just feels like, oh my God, it's happening all the time because on television it is. So I don't blame parents for being scared out of their minds. That's what the media is trying to do to the point where we'll keep watching. But then that fear becomes the the new normal. And so if you're a parent who decides to turn off the news or decides to go look up actual crime statistics or even your neighborhood's crime statistics and you think, well, you know, it's not that there's no crime, but there's never been a time with zero crime. I mean, there's Cain and Abel. I mean, you know, you go pretty far back. There's always been some crime, but that doesn't mean that Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let my kid have any freedom whatsoever. But then the fear has already become institutionalized. And so a cop who sees your child outside thinks, well, I wouldn't send my kid outside. I was just watching Law & Order last night and it's so scary. And then there was the 10 o'clock news and that was scary. And then there was the Facebook warning and that was scary. I wouldn't do this. So I'm going to arrest the mom who did because she's doing it differently from me. And I care about my kids. So she must not care about her kids. She must be a bad mom. Let me get out the handcuffs. And I, I can tell you the the, the simplest story uh, that sort of shows you what's going on um, was I get letters, I'd say, every week from a parent who has been um, arrested or threatened with arrest for letting their kid do something that was completely innocuous. But the, the one that has me, I guess, most shaken up was a, a letter I got in November uh, from a mom named Maria who had spent uh, a very late night at Yale New Haven Hospital with her aunt who was dying and in fact died that night. And so she was at the hospital until five that morning. She got home about six and what a surprise, she slept through wake up time for her eight year old son for that next morning of school. So the son got himself ready for school and he went outside, turns out he missed his bus. So like any kid that you would be proud of and want to call your own, he started walking to school. He knew the way. It was about two miles away. He starts Mm -hmm. walking. It's November. It's chilly. Um, Somebody sees him outside. And once again, it's that escaped rhinoceros from the zoo. What's this strange thing doing outside on the sidewalk? I've never seen one of these, you know, outside of captivity before. Somebody called 911 and said, there's a child on the loose. Uh, and the cops came by and they found him very easily because there was only one kid walking to school. And, uh, they said, what happened? And he explained that his mother had overslept. And so he'd gotten himself ready for school, missed the bus. And now he's walking. The cop said, oh, that's too bad, kid. And they put him in the car and they drove him to school. And if that was the end of it, I'd say that was nice. Uh, you know, that, that, that would be my, fine. Yeah. <laughs> my tax dollars at work. Okay. Helping this kid out. Not that he needed it, but why not? But in fact, they dropped him off at school. They made a U-turn. They came to the mother's house. They pound on the door. They open it up. They say, where's your kid? And she says, oh, he's, uh, uh, she's getting ready for school, I guess. I don't know. She's like wiping the sleep out of her eyes. And they said, he is not. You don't know this, but he left for school today and you were asleep. And they said to her these words, you are despicable an eight-year-old walking by himself. And they put her in handcuffs and they threw her in the cruiser and they took her to the station house. And if you want to look up her mugshot, it's there online. Her her married last name is Hassan Kali, H-A-S-N-K-O-L-L-I. And uh, they took her mugshot and then they released her on a $2,500 bail. And so far, her case keeps being pushed back. It's been It was supposed to be in January and February. Now it's been pushed back till March. And that's the the criminal case. But in the meantime, she's been investigated by Child Protective Services and they just issued a report to her and she wrote, she sent it to me. It was either last week or the week before. And they go through the whole house and she has, I think, five or six kids. And they're like, why is this child living downstairs when he should be living upstairs with the other children? I wouldn't have the eight-year-old in the same, you know, on the same floor as the 12-year-old. I would put him on the same floor as the seven-year-old. And it's like, why are you guys deciding which rooms my kid should live in? I mean, like to a hammer, everything's a nail and to child protective <laughs> services come to come to look at the, the house of this horrible woman who overslept when her son was going to school. They start poking around and, you know, the child seems well cared for, but still. And, and they're really sort of desperately hunting for something that they can um, say is wrong with her or her child rearing. And frankly, if the kid is not starved 
and the kid is not beaten and the kid is not chained to a radiator, um, <laughs> I would say that, and, and the kid is not complaining. You know, the kid was just getting himself to school one day. I mean, even if it was the wrong thing, you're allowed like a get out of jail free card. <laughs> you know, one morning of bad parenting should not mean that the government is allowed to start snooping around and deciding the sleeping arrangements of your children. So this is very disturbing to me and it's very disturbing to her. And she doesn't know, you know, there's no way to look unguilty if somebody has decided that everything you do that isn't the exact same the way they, they would do it is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, that, that is definitely true. And, and, and I mean, just looking back at, at when I grew up, uh, I was able to I think I was in uh, it was it was a small town uh, in mm -hmm. Illinois. Uh, oh. It was a, it was a, it was a I small town. Uh, what was that? I'm from Illinois too. I'm just from the suburbs, so suburbs of Chicago. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. I live in Central Illinois right now, and uh, mm -hmm. they yeah, that's uh, where I where I grew up was probably Central Illinois too. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I walked to school. There was no problem with it. It was it mm -hmm. was maybe maybe a half a mile or a mile. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I, I and I was able to play outside and do all of those things. Um, but uh, there there was still like uh, my mom would still take me into the into the women's bathroom until I was probably like ten, which was kind of odd. So there was like there was like the the good and the bad, I guess you could say. Um, but 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 yeah, I, I definitely kind of see what you're saying, and that's 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 got to be kind of kind of scary. Um, but uh, and I think the the kind of symptom of this when you look at the public the public schooling and you look at uh, uh, and and you look at CPS and just the investigation we were just mentioning. Uh, I mean, the the state thinks they own your children. <laughs> that's that they think they do. That they think they know how to raise your children better than you do, and uh, right. that's and, definitely and, you know, a major it, problem. It, it's sort of a vicious circle too, in that um, you know the state is often invited in or alerted to this quote unquote you know improper parenting by passersby. Um, one thing that people find me and they're always emailing me in the middle of the night, they're distraught, and this is generally the story. Uh, they were driving to the drugstore or the dry cleaner or the grocery, and finally their kid who had a cold or the flu or whatever fell asleep in the back seat. And the kid is anywhere from a baby to seven years old. And rather than waking the kid, they park in front of the dry cleaner and they run in and they're waiting behind two people to get their clothing back or whatever it is. And in the meantime, somebody sees that there's a child in a car and that's so terrible that they assume that the child is instantly going to die because there's some new physical law of the universe that children die. If the car is moving, they're alive. But if the car is parked, somehow they instantly die. And they call 911. And in come the cops and the mother, by the time she's getting out of the car, the cops have always already been summoned and they start reading her the riot act. You never leave a kid in the car. I have, I have a piece on this um, on my site from last week um, on my, my blog is free range kids. And this was a case of a man who called, I can't remember if he actually called the cops or not, but he videotaped himself haranguing a woman you left your baby in the car never do that you can't do that you just can't do that and it's like it's true sometimes you can't do that if it is a hundred degrees outside don't do it if you're going to be gone for a long time don't do it if you're running in to as this woman was make one return at target or pick up the pizza you can do it just the same way our parents did with us. Uh, it's Indeed. a hysterical culture that believes that the second your eyes aren't on the kid, because they're in a car and your eyes aren't on them, they're going to die. There's there's no rational, There's that. it's absolutely not true. And in <laughs> fact, more kids die in parking lots than die in parked cars. And far more children die as passengers. I mean, that's the number one way kids die is being driven somewhere. So why don't we arrest moms? who drive their children somewhere, that's not a problem. And, and and I don't think we should. But somehow we believe that the minute the car is parked, all bets are off. And it's not true. But I hear all the time from the parents who have been arrested and are now being, you know, facing either criminal charges or they have to take a parenting class or they have to par pay a fine or they have to find a lawyer um, simply because some busybody assumed that they cared more about your kid than you did. And, and my the favorite example I have of this, how insane it has gotten, is I heard from a mom who was grocery shopping. She put the, the groceries in the car. She put the kids in the car. She returned the cart to the cart corral. And by the time she got back to the cart to the car from the cart corral, which cannot be far, <laughs> somebody was screaming, I can't believe you left your children. Anything could happen. We just have this 
completely wow. um, movie uh, movie plot idea that you turn your back for one second and the car goes up in flames, but not before it's been carjacked and um, <laughs> and, and the children have been kidnapped and raped. It just doesn't happen that way. Thank God. I'm, I'm once again. I'm, I'm knocking on wood, but. We really have a much more dramatic idea of the world out there than it really is. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely true. And I, I remember when I when I was growing up, even from like uh, probably like age six or seven up to like ten, uh, mm -hmm. like my my parents would leave me in the car. The, but the, obviously they did they did their spiel. Don't like don't unlock the doors for anybody except for me. Um, mm -hmm. Which I mean that's that's whatever. It's uh, obviously they you gotta you gotta be at least somewhat cautious. But uh, but yeah, they left me in the car and nothing ever happened to me, thankfully. But uh, uh, but yeah, there's definitely this uh, perpetual fear that's kind of, that's pushed mm -hmm. by the government, the media, and and mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and obviously just society so today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, the marketplace has a, a big role to play too. In that, if it can make you afraid of something, that it can sell you a product that will you know, reassure you somewhat. And and in fact, I think that that's one of the reasons that we're more afraid is, first of all, they're making us afraid of all these things that could possibly happen. But also, once you get into the habit of thinking that you really can control every bit of fate, you know, that nothing bad will ever happen to your kid if you only buy another app, if you only, you know, purchase another camera, if you only shackle them to you for 24-7, if you only drive them everywhere, um, it, it can drive you to the point where you really feel like you must be watching them every second because you can be watching them every second. And if you can be watching them every second, woe to you for taking your eyes off them because what if something bad happens? That's all your fault. So the <laughs> ability to constantly um, have our kids under our own supervision and surveillance and whether it's by GPS or by having us with them or by putting them in a there are daycare centers where there's there's uh, cameras trained on the children all the time. If they go off to camp, everybody sees pictures of them in every activity during the day. You just get to the point where you think that I'm watching them all the time, and if I'm not watching them all the time, something bad will happen. Indeed, yes, uh, yeah, and and definitely well said. Um, we've got about uh, probably eight and a half minutes left, and there are two, <laughs> two at least two things I I, I really want to get to. And the fir sure. first off, uh, obviously the the direct action series is. Uh, um, or the the direct action series, and also the free member of direct action, is trying to give give our listeners the the tools and information necessary oh. to actually create the freedom they desire in their own oh, lives. Great, and free great, range great. parenting is one uh -huh. thing on there. So um, we've uh -huh. we've kind of discussed uh, some bad things that the happen. Problems. That, that, oh, yeah, let me that talk about some parents. solutions. Okay, okay, I got a bunch. Yep. Okay, first is very simple. If you go to free range friend. Dot com. It's just a site I made. It's free. You put in your zip code and the age of your kids, and um, everything is anonymous. Nobody can track you down, uh, except possibly the NSA. But um, you put in your zip code, and you can find other parents in the neighborhood who would also like to send their kids out on Saturdays or also have Wednesdays free. So it's just a way of finding fellow free rangers. That's just the easiest thing you could do. The second thing, uh, there's two more things I'm going to say really quickly. Second thing is what I call the Free Range Kids Project. And um, I'd say about four schools across the country have done this so far. And it is very easy and it's also free. Um, it's this. You you go to my blog, which is freerangekids.com. And at the top on um, the little, uh, you know, tab bar, you, there's one thing that says FRK Project, Free Range Kids Project. And it's this. You ask the teachers at the school, you can present it to the PTA, you can present it to the principal, to have the kids, to tell the kids, listen, today I want you to go home and ask your parents if there's one thing that you feel you're ready to do that for one reason or another you haven't done yet. And this could be anywhere from kindergarten through eighth grade. They can um, make their own lunch. They can walk to school. They can make dinner. They can walk the dog. They can ride their bike to the library. Something that you or I would have done without a second thought when we were growing up that's now considered, you know, something that you wait way, way longer for letting your kids <laughs> do. And, and because it's endorsed by the school, and because it is a one-shot deal, parents often say yes. And really, this is the thing that's going to change your listeners' lives way more than listening to me, which is once you see your kid has run the errand and they've come back with their, their bag of Wonder Bread or they're bringing home the milk or they walk the dog and they walk through the door and they are so proud that they got to do something, that you believed in them, that they got to be part of 
family life. It wasn't just everything being given to them that they sort of pulled their own weight for once. They just can't get over how excited they are. And when you see your kid that excited, you end up that excited too. It's, it's, I've seen it over and over again. I did an entire TV series based on this. It's the pride that you feel in your kid walking through the door, reminding you of your own self, um, replaces the fear. It's like the Grinch. There's not enough space left in the heart for both of them, and the joy floods in. And the fear, which was only you imagining, oh, if they go around the corner, what if the boogeyman? But they went around the corner, and instead they came back with the Wonder Bread. That changes you at least as much as it changes your kids. So I would say ask your school or ask your teacher, your kid's teacher, to possibly consider the Free Range Kids Project. And if you do click on you know, my site and you look at that little tab, uh, I wrote an article on it um, in the Atlantic. So it has like this legitimacy of, oh my God, it's even in the Atlantic. So it's <laughs> it's not a crazy idea. It's very simple. And the third thing is also it's on my site. Um, it's called the Free Range Kids Bill of Rights. And it's what I stated at the beginning, which is um, we all want to live in a town where we can let our kids walk to school and not worry about them getting arrested. And we want the, you know, I sort of like the idea that townspeople are watching out for each other, but I don't like the idea that they call the police to arrest. <laughs> you know, if like, they see a kid outside, I'm happy that they're making sure my kid is okay. I think that that's what a community does. But rather than, than calling 911, I'd, I'd like them to say, hey, kid, or, you know, where are you headed? Oh, you're headed home? Okay, do you know your way? Fine, great. And then let them go on their way. Or if they feel compelled, like, oh, I'm just a little too worried. I'm going to call the cops. I would like the cops, if they come over, rather than saying, let me go arrest your mom, to say, do you know where you're going? Yes, I do. Okay, great. Well, listen, be safe and stay on the sidewalk or look both ways before you cross the street. You can have the exact same structure of your town that you had before with strangers looking at your kid and cops checking in on your kid, except flip it to, to come from a place of benefit of the doubt. So that rather than assuming that the parents could care less about their kid and are negligent hussies and are off just, you know, pursuing their own careers, for God's sake, instead of walking their kid across <laughs> the street, assume that they love their children and that they think that this makes sense. And one of the reasons they think it makes sense is because there is you the citizen out there watching to make sure the kid knows how to cross the street. There is you, the cop, you know, just driving by slowly and seeing is everything okay at the park. You know, you don't have to change all of society. You just have to change the basic assumption instead of I can't wait to, you know, to teach that parent a lesson, turn it into I'm going to help that parent because that's what a community is. Indeed, indeed. It looks like we've got about two and a half minutes left, and that should leave time for, for this uh, this final question. Um, sure. So um, within the libertarian community, there's something called peaceful parenting, which uh, I'm sure you've come across. Actually, uh, no, which... I don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Is... okay. Well, um, well, peaceful parenting, uh, it claims that spanking is an initiatory force against the child. It violates their self-ownership. Um, so since you do a lot of stuff with parenting, I figured it'd be mm -hmm. a, like a good question to ask you. Uh, do you think sp spanking a child is child abuse? I think everybody knows the difference between a spanking and child abuse. You know, there's it's it's obvious, right? Abuse is cruelty, and it's um, just taking something out on a kid. Whereas spanking, once in a while, if you have to spank a kid, I haven't spanked my kids, but I remember being spanked a little bit um, as a kid. And I think if it's, you know, if the child knows that you love them and knows that you care about them, like I said, what we have to swoop in and is when children are beaten, when they're starved when they're given drugs and when they're pimped out. And I think we all know the difference between true <laughs> abuse and a difference in parenting styles. I mean, there are some parents who yell and parents who don't yell and parents who drive their kids and parents who let their kids walk and parents who buy organic and parents who don't and the breastfeeders and the non-breastfeeders and we're all different. And it doesn't make a difference if you're showing your kid that you love them and you're making sure they get fed. Um, you know, from there on in, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt that they're doing the best they can. Indeed, indeed. Well said. And I th you, you kind of you made a good point there. There's definitely a line between spanking and child abuse. But uh, but the, and this is kind of uh, I've I've actually had uh, someone on my show to talk about peaceful parenting and and uh, that's kind of uh, I, they they view any like any act of spanking or hitting the child as, as child abuse. And I, I just I think that's I, I'm not a big fan of gray areas, but I think there's probably uh, uh, there's probably a, it's it's probably not just uh, black and white. It's so like funny that. that you mentioned spanking and hitting. To me, spanking is something that you do with a small child to say, I told you, you can't go outside without telling me or something like that. Hitting seems 
weirder. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't imagine ever hitting a child. Spanking feels like it's an age old um, disciplinary technique. And I'm not talking about with a strap. And I'm not talking with a cat of nine tails. I'm talking about, I told you, you know, you had to let me know if you were going outside or whatever. I mean, the other thing is that people think of free range kids as a parenting philosophy. And I don't think it is. I mean, as we've been discussing, it's, it's a philosophy about um, how did we get so afraid that we think that anytime a child is unsupervised, something drastic, something horrible is going to happen and something drastic must be done to the parents. So really, I think of myself as, um, as the movement, I should say, as uh, countering the idea that our children are in constant danger and therefore that we have to parent like they are and that we have to police like they are. Our children aren't in constant danger. And once, once you realize that, you can let kids walk to school again. You can let kids wait in the car again. You can give kids the benefit of the doubt. And you can certainly give the benefit of the doubt to the parents, too. Indeed, indeed. Well said. Um, so, yeah, well, looks like we, uh, we're up to our 30 minutes. So why don't you give out your links uh, one more time for the listeners? Oh, sure. Um, so my blog is Free Range Kids and my Twitter feed is Free Range Kids. And my book happens to be Free Range Kids, but I couldn't figure it out for this for this site where people find each other, um, you know, to to let their kids go free together. And so that's called Free Range Friend, um, which I realize sounds like Friendster or something else. But anyways, um, <laughs> I hope you'll find me there. I'm, I'm really easy to get in touch with. You can always drop me a line. My contact is on the blog. And um, and I thank you for this this opportunity to talk to everybody tonight. Oh, not a problem, Lenore. Thank you very much for coming on. I definitely appreciate it. And uh, you have a great rest of your evening. Okay, thanks. Right. Go Oscars. Let us see you. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> All right, see you. Thanks.